when death's door is about to open. There are over 450,000 children born out of wedlock in the United States each year, and over a million and a half teenagers enter penal institutions for car thefts and other crimes. These personal tragedies could in many instances be avoided if a. the parents learned how to employ suggestion properly, and b. if their sons and daughters were taught how effectively to use spiritual self-suggestion. Through the proper use of suggestion, these young people could be motivated to develop inviolable moral standards through their own conscious auto-suggestion, and they would know how to neutralize or repel the undesirable suggestions of their associates in an intelligent manner. Of course, every individual responds to unconscious auto-suggestion throughout his life more often than he does to conscious auto-suggestion. In such instances, he responds to habit and the inner urge of the subconscious. When a man with PMA is faced with a serious personal problem, self-motivators flash from the subconscious to the conscious to aid him. This is especially true in times of emergency especially when death's door is about to be opened. Such was the case with Ralph Wepner of Toowoomba, Queensland, Australia, one of our PMA Science of Success course students. It was 1.30 in the morning. In a small hospital bedroom, two nursing sisters were keeping vigil beside Ralph's body. At 4.30 the afternoon before, an emergency call had been made to his family to rush to the hospital. When they arrived at his bedside, Ralph was in a state of coma as the result of a severe heart attack. The family was now out in the corridor, each one worrying or praying in his own special way. In the dimly lit bedroom, two nursing sisters worked anxiously, one on each wrist trying to feel a pulse beat. Because Ralph had not come out of the coma during this entire six-hour period and the doctor had done all that he felt he could, the doctor had left the room he had gone to visit one of his other hospital patients, who was also in a critical condition. Ralph couldn't move, talk, or feel anything. Yet he could hear the voices of the sisters. He could think quite clearly during portions of this period. He heard one sister excitedly state, He's not breathing. Can you pick up a beat? The answer was, No. Again and again he heard the question and answer, Can you now pick up a beat? No. I'm all right, he thought, but I must tell them. Somehow I must tell them. At the same time, he was amused at the sisters for being fooled like that. He kept thinking, I'm quite all right. I'm not going to die. But how? How can I tell them? And then he remembered the self-motivator he had learned. You can do it if you believe you can. He tried to open his eyes, but it seemed the more he tried, the more he failed. His eyelids wouldn't respond to the command of his will. He tried to move his arm, his leg, his head, but he couldn't feel any reaction at all. In fact, he didn't feel a thing. Again and again he tried to open his eyes, until at last he heard the words, I saw one eyelid flicker. He's still there. I felt no fear, Ralph says, and still thought how amusing it was. Periodically one sister called to me, Are you there, Mr. Wepner? Are you there? To which I would try to respond by moving my eyelid to tell them that I was all right. I was still there. This went on for a considerable time, until through constant effort Ralph was at last able to open one, then both eyes. It was then that his doctor returned. With wonderful skill and persistence, the doctor and nurses brought him back to life. Hidden Persuaders but it was the auto-suggestion, you can do it if you believe you can, that he had memorized from the PMA Science of Success course that helped to rescue him when he was at death's door. Now the books we read and the thoughts we think affect our subconscious minds, but there are also unseen forces that likewise have powerful effects even though they are subliminal, below the realm of consciousness. These unseen forces can be from known physical causes or from unknown sources. Before discussing the unknown, let's illustrate with an example that is now common knowledge since the publishing of Hidden Persuaders by Vance Packard. The story first appeared in American newspapers and later was picked up in magazines. 
let's consider a report that appeared in a leading national magazine on the subject of subliminal advertising. The report tells of an experiment conducted in a New Jersey movie theater, in which advertising messages were flashed on the screen so fast that the viewers were not consciously aware of them. During a period of six weeks, more than 40,000 persons unknowingly became subjects of this test while attending the theater. Flashed on the screen by a special process that made them invisible to the naked eye were two advertising messages concerning products that were available in the theater lobby. At the end of the six weeks, results were tabulated. Sales of one of the products had soared over 50%, while sales of the other product rose almost 20%. The inventor of the process explained that although the messages were invisible, they still had taken effect on many in the audience because of the ability of the subconscious mind to absorb impressions that are too fleeting to be registered consciously. When this story appeared in the press, the public was horrified by this attempt to channel our thinking habits, our purchasing decisions, and our thought processes by the use of subliminal suggestion. People were afraid they feared brainwashing in its most subtle form. Yet it is amazing to us that someone didn't take the PMA approach. Subliminal suggestion can be employed for desirable objectives, too. Everyone knows that power can be used for evil or for good, depending upon how it is directed. Now that the experiment has proved its purpose, it doesn't take much imagination to see what the beneficial results to the viewers would be should the following self-motivators be flashed on a movie screen. God is always a good God. Day by day, in every way, through the grace of God, you are getting better and better. Have the courage to face the truth. What the mind of man can conceive and believe, the mind of man can achieve with PMA. Every adversity has the seed of an equivalent or greater benefit for those who have positive mental attitude. You can do it if you believe you can. This would be a PMA approach provided, of course, the consent of the audience was obtained in advance. Another illustration of a known physical force affecting the subconscious mind can be shown by the effect of radar on navigators. Why did the SS Andrea Doria and the SS Volchum sink. When the Andrea Doria, captained by Pierre Clamay, and the Stockholm, under Captain H.O. Nordensen, collided approximately 50 miles off Nantucket Island, 50 persons died. The Andrea Doria was sighted by the radar operator of the Stockholm when they were 10 miles apart. The Grace Line luxury liner the Santa Rosa, under Captain Frank S. Sivik, collided with the tanker Volchum on March 26, 1959, 22 miles off the New Jersey coast. Four crewmen were killed. Second mate Walter Wells, the radar operator on the Santa Rosa, claimed he had made two plottings of the tanker Volchum's course. No satisfactory explanation of the true cause of these collisions has resulted from the investigations in either of these instances. Could the waves from the radar instruments have been the real cause? Perhaps Sidney A. Schneider has the answer. As a young teenager, Sidney A. Schneider of Skokie, Illinois, became interested in hypnotism when he observed his older brother, a university student, successfully place his first subject under hypnosis. Sidney became an expert hypnotist. During his business career, he became a radio operator and an engineer in electronics. In the Second World War, Sidney Schneider was a vital part of the system known as IFF, Information, Friend, or Foe. His job was to see to it that every ship leaving our country was equipped with radar. He noticed that radar operators sometimes went into a trance. They weren't aware that they had been in a trance when they came out of it. Because of his knowledge of hypnosis and electronics, Schneider concluded that the fixed attention of the naval employees took place when the waves from the radar machine were synchronized with the brain waves of the operator. On this theory, he changed the waves on the radar instrument and eliminated the recurrence of the trances. Sidney Schneider told us that he converted his conclusions regarding the principle that placed the seaman operating radar in a trance into the brainwave synchronizer 
a machine which he invented after the war. What is the Brainwave Synchronizer? It is an electronic instrument designed to induce various levels of hypnosis by subliminal and photic, light, stimulation of the brainwaves. The instrument can be used alone or combined with a tape recording of the therapist's verbal suggestions. No physical connections or attachments are placed on the patient. Results are obtained at any distance in which the light in the machine is visible. The apparatus induces light to deep hypnotic levels in over 90% of the subjects in an average time of three minutes. In an experiment with the brainwave synchronizer, none of the persons involved was informed about the machine or what it could do. Neither were they told that they were subjects of an experiment. Yet 30% of them were hypnotized to various degrees, ranging from light to deep states. Why and how does the brainwave synchronizer work, we asked. It is like a television transmitter, Schneider said. The human brain produces pulses, waves, of electricity in several frequency ranges. This knowledge has been applied in the field of medicine since 1929 and the invention of the electroencephalograph, commonly known as the EEG machine, an apparatus for recording brainwaves. My machine operates much like a television system, Schneider continued. The reason the picture on your receiving set does not drift up or down is that the pulses generated within the set synchronize with corresponding pulses generated by the transmitting television station. The receiver is forced to operate at a rate controlled by the transmitter and the picture must obey. Like the transmitter of a television station, the brainwave synchronizer also produces synchronizing pulses. And through photic stimulation, the waves sent from the synchronizer cause the frequency of the brainwaves also to lock in step. At this point, hypnosis can be achieved. Just compare your brain to a receiving set and the brainwave synchronizer to a television transmitter. And you will see as you continue to listen that in addition to comparing your brain to a receiving set, you can compare it to a television transmitter also. A little knowledge becomes a dangerous thing. We have just explored some of the unseen forces from known physical causes. Now let's proceed further into the realm of the unknown, the thrilling field of psychic phenomena, such as 1. ESP Extrasensory Perception Awareness of or response to an external event or influence not apprehended by sensory means. Here are included A. Telepathy, thought transference. B. Clairvoyance, the power of discerning objects not present to the senses. C. Precognition, seen into the future. D. Postcognition, seen into the past. 2. Psychokinesis The effect of the mind on an object Now let's be realistic and keep our feet firmly on the ground. Let's explore the unknown with common sense. You'll be in danger unless you use good logic and avoid the gathering of cobwebs in your thinking. Facts should be your stepping stones over the river of doubt. Therefore, let an experienced guide direct you along safe paths and we will introduce you to such a guide. But before we do, let's talk about the past. Thomas J. Hudson's famous book, The Law of Psychic Phenomena, when published in 1893, became a bestseller. The book is published today in paperback by Kessinger Publishing, Whitefish, Montana. It contained many thrilling stories of reported psychic experiences. The imaginations of tens of thousands of people who read this book were stimulated. Some were ready, some were not. From then on, public interest in psychic phenomena made rapid progress. But many persons, not properly prepared, injured themselves by becoming crackpots. This was due to the awesomeness and magnetic interest a little knowledge of psychic powers generated within them. There is a noticeable tendency of some persons who are not properly educated and mature in their thinking and not very well adjusted emotionally to become fascinated with this intriguing study. It is easy to understand why so many religious leaders, scientists, 
and persons responsible for the welfare of the people, found the study of psychic phenomena an anathema. 1. Imaginations ran rampant and threatened the sanity of the people. 2. Fact and fiction seemed to be indistinguishable. 3. Hypnotism by amateurs and vaudeville entertainers, as well as the trickery and frauds practiced by fakirs, mediums, and charlatans, abused the minds of the public. 4. Basic religious principles were twisted in a direction that led to evil. Anything associated with psychic phenomena became repellent. It was taboo. In spite of the dangers, taboos, and social or professional ostracism, there were courageous, honorable men with good common sense who had the courage to explore for the truth. But it remained for the long, courageous fight of Dr. Joseph Banks Ryan, formerly of Duke University, inspired and assisted by his wife, Dr. Louisa E. Ryan, to clothe the study of psychic phenomena with respectability. This is due to the impeccable character of Dr. Ryan and to his 30 years of controlled laboratory experiments based on mathematical laws. His task was a difficult one, because spontaneous psychic phenomena are not apt to occur in a laboratory. Such phenomena occur when least expected, and most often when a person is under the greatest emotional strain or possessed of an intensified obsessional desire, often simultaneously with the death of a loved one. Westinghouse Invests in ESP Communication It is apparent that any writer on the subject of psychic phenomena today endeavors to have the protection of a part of the cloak of Dr. Rhine's respectability by referring to Dr. Rhine and Duke University to make his own theories digestible. We are no exception. We urgently suggest that if you are interested further, you read The Reach of the Mind and other books of which Dr. Ryan is the author or co-author. Our recommendation, let Dr. Joseph Banks Ryan be your guide. And how successful has Dr. Ryan's work been in breaking down the resistance to investigation and belief in these strange mind powers? A fair test, it would seem to us, lies in the fact that hard-headed businessmen are convinced and are making experiments of their own. In an interview, Dr. Peter A. Castruccio, director of the Westinghouse Astronautics Institute, confirmed that Westinghouse scientists are engaged in research to find a means of using telepathy and clairvoyance for long-distance communication. Dr. Castruccio, too, had many lengthy visits with Dr. Ryan before a decision was reached to engage in this great experiment. And will the search for ways and means to harness telepathy and clairvoyance and make them commercially feasible be successful? Let us answer this as follows. Not too long ago, people were scoffing at ideas that were unbelievable to them then, but are taken for granted today. A. Matter being turned into energy and energy into matter. B. The breaking of the atom. C. Man-made satellites. D. Jet power, or E. Everyday necessities, like television, for example. And what about the electronic computer that was designed from the human computer, the human brain, and the nervous system? Everyone was conceived, believed, and achieved by men with PMA. Machines that operate with the speed of light, 186,300 miles per second. Machines that can calculate 40,000 arithmetical operations per second and detect and correct their own errors. Machines that became a reality because man built into them electrical circuits which in many respects function like the known electrical activity of the nervous system of your own physical body. Our answer. What the mind of man can conceive and believe, the mind of man can achieve with PMA. But no machine or man-made invention is as marvelous as the wonderful human computer you own, your brain and your nervous system, with their power of electrical activity. Man is more than a body with a brain. You are a mind with a body, a mind possessing and also affected by powers known and unknown, a mind composed of two parts, the conscious and the subconscious. Here we have stressed most the concept of the subconscious mind, its powers and the forces known and unknown that affect it. But what about the conscious mind, 
that is equally important, and you will hear about it in the next chapter entitled, And Something More. Now, if your reaction to what you have heard has not given you an insight on how you can turn the right knob or push the right button to get what you want from the machine you own, dare to explore the powers of your mind. Be guided by pilot number four and something more. Pilot number four. Thoughts to steer by. One. You are a mind with a body. Your body is an electrical machine. Your brain is a mechanism that is an electrical marvel. 2. Your mind has two parts, the conscious and the subconscious. They work together. 3. Conscious autosuggestion and self-suggestion are synonymous and are contrasted with the word autosuggestion, an unconscious activity. Autosuggestion automatically sends messages from the subconscious to the conscious mind as well as to parts of the body. The subconscious mind is the seat of habit, memory, inviolable standards of conduct, etc. 4. Day by day, in every respect, I am getting better and better. Self-affirmations repeated with frequency, rapidity, and emotion affect the subconscious mind and cause it to react. Bill McCall acquired wealth through the use of self-suggestion. 5. Kuwait's great discovery was you can use healthful, positive suggestions to help yourself, and you can also refrain from negative, harmful suggestions. 6. Learn to use the proper suggestion in influencing others. Learn to employ the right conscious auto-suggestions. When you do, you can have physical, mental, and moral health, happiness, and success. 7. You can do it if you have PMA, and believe you can. 8. Hidden Persuaders Take the PMA Approach 9. Your brain sends out energy in the form of brain waves, and this energy is power which can affect another person or an object. 10. A little knowledge may be a dangerous thing. Dare to explore the powers of your mind. When you enter the dangerous, unexplored territory of psychic phenomena, let Dr. Joseph Banks Ryan be your guide. Day by day, in every way, through the grace of God, I am getting better and better through PMA. Chapter 5 And Something More Have you sincerely tried and still failed? Perhaps you failed because there was something more that was needed to bring you the success you were seeking. Euclid's axiom says, the whole is equal to the sum of all the parts and is greater than any of its parts. This can be rated, assimilated, and applied to every result or achievement. Conversely, any part is smaller than the whole. Therefore, it's important that you add all the necessary parts to complete the whole. A negative mental attitude is one of the primary causes of failure. You may be needlessly ignorant of facts, universal laws and powers. You may know many of them, but fail to apply them to a specific need. You may not know how you can affect, use, control, or harmonize with powers known and unknown. When you seek success with PMA, you keep trying. You keep searching to find something more. Failure is experienced by those who, when they experience defeat, stop trying to find the something more. It's easy when you learn the something more and experience the know-how. Give a puzzle to a child, and he may not solve it. If he keeps trying and learns how to solve it, he can then work it quickly. You aren't a child, but perhaps there are several of life's puzzles you would like to solve. You can solve them more easily with PMA. For example, there once was a songwriter who wrote a song but couldn't get it published. George M. Cohen bought it and added something more. The something more made George M. Cohen a fortune. He merely added three little words. Hip, hip, hooray. Thomas Edison tried more than 10,000 experiments before he developed a successful incandescent lamp. But after each defeat, he kept searching for something more until he found what he was looking for. When the unknown became known to him, 
innumerable electric light bulbs could be manufactured. It was necessary only to apply the universal laws that had always existed, but which had not been previously recognized as applicable for the specific invention. There are many cures and preventatives for diseases, but at a given time they may be unknown. The medical preventative for polio was unknown until Dr. Jonas Edward Salk used principles of universal law that were previously not applied by the medical profession for the prevention of this dreaded disease. You may make a million dollars by employing a success formula. If you lose your money, you can make another million, and even more. That is, provided you know the formula and apply it. Suppose you didn't recognize the formula that helped you make your first million. You may fail in your second attempt because you deviate from the principles of success that are applicable. On your second attempt, you may need to make adjustments for changing conditions, but the principles will remain the same. Orville and Wilbur Wright succeeded in flying because they added something more. Many inventors came exceedingly close to inventing the airplane before the Wright brothers. The Wright brothers used the same principles that were employed by the others, but they added something more. They created a new combination, so they succeeded where all others failed. The something more was rather simple. They attached movable flaps of a particular design to the edges of the wings so the pilot could control them and maintain the plane's equilibrium. These flaps were the forerunners of the modern aileron. You'll notice there's a common denominator to all these success stories. In each case, the secret ingredient was the application of a previously unapplied universal law. That made the difference. So if you are standing on the threshold of success without being able to pass over, try adding something more. It needn't be much. The words hip hip hooray were all it took to make a hit tune. Tiny flaps were all it took to make an airplane fly after others failed. It isn't necessarily the quantity of something more, but the inspired quality that counts. Why did the Supreme Court decide that Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone? Many persons claim to have invented the telephone before Alexander Graham Bell. Among those who held prior patents were Gray, Edison, Dolbear, McDonough, Vanderweide, and Race. Philip Race was the only one who apparently came close to success. The little difference that made the big difference was a single screw. Race didn't know that if he had turned one screw one quarter of a turn, he would have transformed interrupted current into continuous current. Then he would have been successful. In a United States Supreme Court case, the court noted that Race knew what had to be done in order to transmit speech by electricity is very apparent, for in his first paper he said, As soon as it is possible to produce anywhere and in any manner vibrations whose curves shall be the same as those of any given tone or combination of tones, we shall receive the same impression as that tone or combination of tones would have produced on us. The court further noted, Race discovered how to reproduce musical tones, but he did no more. He could sing through his apparatus, but he could not talk. From the beginning to the end, he has conceded this. As in the case of the Wright brothers, the something more Bell added was comparatively simple. He switched from an intermittent to a continuous current, the only type capable of reproducing human speech. The two currents are exactly the same direct current, Intermittent means breaking with a slight pause. Specifically, Bell kept the circuit open instead of breaking the circuit intermittently as Race had done. The court concluded, Race never thought of it, and he failed to transmit speech telegraphically. Bell did, and he succeeded. Under such circumstances, it is impossible to hold that what Race did was an anticipation of the discovery of Bell. To follow Race is to fail but to follow Bell is to succeed. The difference between the two is just the difference between failure and success. If Race had kept on, he might have found out the way to succeed, but he stopped and failed. Bell took up his work and carried it on to a successful result. His silent senior partner inspired him to success. 
R.G. Letourneau, builder of heavy earth-moving equipment, motivated thousands of persons with his inspirational speeches. In these talks, he referred reverently to my senior partner. He told about the inspiration and help he received from the partner. Letourneau had little formal education, but he performed feats of engineering that are astounding. As a subcontractor on the great Hoover Dam in Nevada, Letourneau lost a fortune because he ran into an unexpected strata of rock. The cost of drilling through the rock was more than he had calculated in estimating his contract, so he went broke trying to fulfill his end of the bargain. But instead of brooding over his loss, Letourneau turned to prayer. How did he pray? By expressing gratitude, profound gratitude for what he had left, a sound body, a strong pair of hands, a brain that could think, and something more. In my hour of greatest distress, said Letourneau, I found my greatest asset in the revelation and discovery of a silent senior partner. I have since recognized this partner in my personal and business life. Everything I have, everything I have done that has been worthwhile, I owe to him. Napoleon Hill was associated with Mr. Letourneau for eighteen months and had an opportunity to observe him closely. By this time, Letourneau had become a well-known inspirational lecturer. He devoted much of his time to traveling around the country in his private plane, preaching his message, It's wonderful to be in partnership with God. One night, when the two men were flying home from a speaking engagement in North Carolina, something interesting happened. Soon after his pilot took off, Mr. Letourneau went to sleep. In about thirty minutes, Napoleon Hill saw him take a little notebook from his pocket and write several lines in it. After the plane landed, Napoleon Hill asked Mr. Letourneau if he remembered writing in his notebook. Why, no, exclaimed Letourneau. He immediately pulled the notebook from his pocket and looked at it. He said, Here it is. I've been looking for this for several months. Here's the answer to a problem that has kept me from completing a machine we are working on. When you receive a flash of inspiration, write it down. This may be the something more that you are looking for. We believe that communication with infinite intelligence is through the subconscious mind. We believe you should establish the habit of immediately writing down flashes of inspiration as they are communicated to you from the subconscious to the conscious. Albert Einstein developed intricate and profound theories regarding the universe and the natural laws that control it. Yet he used only the simplest but most important of instruments ever invented, a pencil and a piece of paper. He wrote down his questions and answers. You will develop your mental powers when you learn and develop the habit of asking yourself questions. When you learn and develop the habit of using pencil and paper to write down your questions, ideas, and answers. It is unlikely that Einstein and other scientists would have come to their successful conclusions unless they had learned from the recorded knowledge of mathematicians and scientists who preceded them. It is also unlikely that Einstein would have tried unless he had been motivated to search for universal principles after having developed the habit of engaging in thinking time and action. Do you know of any great thinker or person of achievement who does not make notes of ideas that occur to him? Learn Creative Thinking from the Creative Thinker Your Creative Power and Applied Imagination by Alex F. Osborne of the advertising firm of Batten, Barton, Durston, and Osborne have inspired hundreds of thousands of persons to engage in creative thinking. What is equally important, these people have been motivated to positive, constructive action. Thinking is not creative unless it is followed through with action. Osborne, like so many creative thinkers, used a notepad and a pencil as favorite working tools. When an idea occurred, he jotted it down. He, like other great men of accomplishment, engaged in thinking, planning, and study time. Alex Osborne stated an obvious truth when he said, Everyone has some creative ability, but most people haven't learned to use it. Osborne's brainstorming methods, explained in his easily read textbook, Applied Imagination, are being employed in college classrooms, factories, business offices, churches, clubs, and in the home. Brainstorming, as developed by Osborne, 
is a very simple method whereby two or more persons use their collective imaginations to come up with ideas that flash from their subconscious to their conscious minds in answer to a question incorporating a specific problem. The ideas are written down just as fast as they strike the minds of the participants. No critical judgment is permitted until after many ideas are written down. Later, the ideas are screened and judged to determine their practicality and value. LaSalle College in Philadelphia and many universities throughout the country teach well-rounded courses in creative thinking which include the methods used by creative thinkers in many phases of business and industry. It was just such creative thinking that enabled Dr. Elmer Gates to make this world a better place in which to live. Dr. Gates was a great American teacher, philosopher, psychologist, scientist, and inventor. During his lifetime, he developed hundreds of inventions and discoveries in the various arts and sciences. He did his creative thinking by sitting for ideas. Dr. Gates' own life proved that his methods of brain and body building could develop a healthy body and increase the efficiency of the mind. Napoleon Hill recalls how, armed with a letter of introduction from Andrew Carnegie, he went to visit Dr. Gates at his Chevy Chase laboratory. When Napoleon Hill arrived, Dr. Gates' secretary told him, I'm sorry, but I'm not permitted to disturb Dr. Gates at this time. How long do you think it will be before I can see him? Napoleon Hill asked. I don't know, but it might take as long as three hours, she responded. Do you mind telling me why you are unable to disturb him? She hesitated and then responded, He is sitting for ideas. Napoleon Hill smiled. What does that mean, sitting for ideas? She returned the smile and said, Maybe we'd better let Dr. Gates explain. I really don't know how long it will take, but you're welcome to wait. If you prefer to come again, I'll see if I can make a definite appointment for you. Mr. Hill decided to wait. It was a valuable decision. What he learned was well worth waiting for. This is how Napoleon Hill tells what happened. When Dr. Gates finally came into the room and his secretary introduced us, I jokingly told him what his secretary had said. After he read the letter of introduction from Andrew Carnegie, he responded pleasantly, Would you be interested in seeing where I sit for ideas and how I go about it? He led me to a small soundproof room. The only furniture in the room consisted of a plain table and a chair. On the table were pads of paper, several pencils, and a push button to turn the lights off and on. In our interview, Dr. Gates explained that when he was unable to obtain an answer to a problem, he went into the room, closed the door, sat down, turned off the lights, and engaged in deep concentration. He applied the success principle of controlled attention asking his subconscious mind to give him an answer to his specific problem, whatever it might be. On some occasions, ideas didn't seem to come through. At other times, they would immediately flow into his mind. And in some instances, it would take as long as two hours before they made an appearance. As soon as ideas began to crystallize, he would turn on the lights and begin to write. Dr. Elmer Gates refined and perfected more than 200 patents which other inventors had undertaken but which had fallen just short of success. He was able to add the missing ingredients, the something more. His method was to begin by examining the application for the patent and its drawings until he found its weakness, the something more that was lacking. He would bring a copy of the patent application and drawings into the room. While sitting for ideas, he would concentrate on finding the solution to a specific problem. When Napoleon Hill asked Dr. Gates to explain the source of his results while sitting for ideas, he gave the following explanation. The sources of all ideas are 1. Knowledge stored in the subconscious mind and acquired through individual experience, observation, and education. 2. Knowledge accumulated by others through the same media, which may be communicated by telepathy. 3. The great universal storehouse of infinite intelligence, wherein is stored all knowledge and all facts, and which may be contacted through the subconscious section of the mind. 
When I sit for ideas, I may tune into one or all of these sources. If other sources of ideas are available, I do not know what they are. Dr. Elmer Gates found the time to concentrate and think in his search for something more. He knew specifically what he was looking for, and he followed through with positive action. In Chapter 7, we will discuss how you can learn to see so that your search for something more will be made easier. In your search, you may fail, but in failing, you may succeed in discovering something even greater. Ask yourself why. Be observant. Think. Get into action. The Bible and both a good comprehensive dictionary and an encyclopedia should, we believe, be in every home. They also can help your search for something more. You don't need to be ashamed to be a failure like Christopher Columbus. Look in your Encyclopedia Britannica and you will find the thrilling, exciting story of Christopher Columbus. He studied astronomy, geometry, and cosmography at the University of Pavia. The book of Marco Polo, theories of geographers, reports, and traditions of mariners, as well as floating works of art, and craftsmanship of non-European origin cast up by the sea. All these stimulated his imagination. Step by step over the years, he came to the firm belief through inductive reasoning that the world was a sphere. Having reached this conclusion, he was convinced through deductive reasoning that the Asiatic continent could be reached by sailing westward from Spain, just as well as Marco Polo had reached it by traveling east. He developed a burning desire to prove his theory. He sought the necessary financial backing, ships, and men to explore the unknown and find something more. He got into action. He kept his mind on his objective. Over a period of ten years, he was often on the verge of receiving the necessary help. But the deception of a king, the ridicule, suspicion, and fear of subordinate government officials, the disbelief of those who wanted to help him, but who at the last moment refused because of the skepticism of their scientific advisors, all brought defeat after defeat. He kept trying. In 1492, he received the help for which he had so persistently searched and prayed. In August of that year, he sailed westward for India, China, and Japan. He was on the right course and headed in the right direction. You know the story. After he landed on the islands in the Caribbean, he returned to Spain with gold, cotton, parrots, curious arms, mysterious plants, unknown birds and beasts, and several natives. He thought he had achieved his objective and had reached the islands off India. He had failed. He had not reached Asia. But without being aware of it immediately, Columbus had found something more, quite a bit more. You like Christopher Columbus, may fail to reach your high major objectives or your magnificent obsessions. You, like him, may fail in your efforts to reach a distant destination in the realm of the unknown. But you may discover something more, something equaling the wealth of the Americas. You, like him, may inspire and direct those who follow you to head in the right direction, on the right course, and to continue further into the unknown until they achieve the worthwhile objectives you conceived. You, like Columbus, have the time and the power to think. You, like him, can persistently strive with a positive mental attitude to achieve your definite major aims to find something more. You don't need to be ashamed to be a failure like Christopher Columbus. And something more, how can you apply it? By now, you should be in a position to extract principles from specific illustrations so that you can relate, assimilate, and use them. We agree with Admiral H. G. Rickover in the fundamental truths of his statement. Among the young engineers we interview, we find few who have received thorough training in engineering fundamentals or principles, but most have absorbed quantities of facts, much easier to learn than principles, but of little use without application of principles. Once a principle has been acquired, it becomes a part of one and is never lost. It can be applied to novel problems and does not become obsolete as do all facts in a changing society. 
Learn the principles. Apply them. If you're not making satisfactory progress toward achieving your aims, look for the something more. It may be known or unknown, but you'll find it if you take the necessary time to study, think, plan, and search for it. Now, this chapter would not be complete without reference to Cosmic Habit Force. Use Cosmic Habit Force is one of the 17 success principles. And the concept of Cosmic Habit Force is easy to understand, for it is a name that we have given to applied power of any natural or universal principle or law, known or unknown. Cosmic Habit Force can be simply defined as the use of universal law, whether it is known or unknown to you. As an example, it's easy to understand that when an object falls to the ground, the law of gravity is being applied. And therefore, if you want an object to fall from a given height, you use cosmic habit force. And in this particular instance, the law of gravity. But the law of gravity, or any other law, is not in itself a power. Yet when you properly use the principle, then power is employed according to universal law. And thus, the breaking of the atom, every invention, every chemical formula, every psychic phenomenon, every individual action and reaction, be it physical, mental, or spiritual, is the result of the use of natural law. For every result there is a cause, and the result is brought about through the use of cosmic habit force. Again, man is a mind with a body, and he can think. It is through thinking that he learns how to use cosmic habit force, and his thinking can bring the thoughts he thinks into reality. This concept is not difficult to comprehend, for in 1900, Albert Einstein gave to the world his now famous formula E equals mc squared. This formula explains the relationship between energy and matter. When matter approaches the speed of light, we call it energy. And as the velocity slows down to zero, it remains matter. In the formula, E is energy, M is mass or matter, and C represents the velocity of light. And thus we see that Einstein's formula is a word symbol of one of the laws of cosmic habit force. And by understanding and applying this formula, man has been able to turn matter into energy and energy into matter, and to use atomic power for constructive purposes, such as to light an entire city, to power ships, or even for such everyday affairs as to develop heat for cooking. And something more. We can now see that because matter and energy are the same thing, everything in the universe is related. Now, you've got a problem? That's good. And you'll learn in the next chapter how to adapt many of the lessons learned in this chapter to your own life. And then you will be able to successfully meet the problems created by the universal law of change, which, like all natural law, is the result of cosmic habit force. Pilot number five, thoughts to steer by. One, and something more. What does the important principle contained in this chapter mean to you? and how can you apply it? 2. If you have failed in an endeavor, could it be because you lack something more? A missing number for a correct winning combination for success. 3. The whole is equal to the sum of all the parts and is greater than any of its parts. Are any missing parts keeping you from success? 4. The little difference between success and failure is often something more. Hip hip hooray, a movable wing flap, a quarter turn of a screw. 5. Are you in partnership with your silent senior partner? 6. Use the simplest but most important of instruments ever invented, paper and pencil, to write down flashes of inspiration when they occur. 7. How does the technique of brainstorming differ from that of sitting for ideas? What is the value of each? 8. Use the success principle of controlled attention. 9. Don't be afraid to be a failure like Christopher Columbus. 10. Have you established the habit of learning fundamental principles, 
or do you merely absorb quantities of facts? 11. Do you understand and can you apply in your own experience the fundamental truths and principles of Admiral H. G. Rickover's statement? Among the young engineers we interview, we find few who have received thorough training in engineering fundamentals or principles, but most have absorbed quantities of facts, much easier to learn than principles, but of little use without application of principles. Once a principle has been acquired, it becomes a part of one and is never lost. It can be applied to novel problems and does not become obsolete as do all facts in a changing society. You don't need to be ashamed to be a failure like Christopher Columbus. Part 2 Five Mental Bombshells for Attacking Success Chapter 6 You've Got a Problem? That's Good so you've got a problem. That's good. Why? Because repeated victories over your problems are the rungs on your ladder of success. With each victory, you grow in wisdom, stature, and experience. You become a better, bigger, more successful person each time you meet a problem and tackle and conquer it with PMA. Stop and think about it for a moment. Do you know of a single instance where any real achievement was made in your life or in the life of any person in history that was not due to a problem with which the individual was faced? Everyone has problems. This is because you and everything in the universe are in a constant process of change. Change is an inexorable natural law. What is important to you is that your success or failure to meet the challenges of change are dependent upon your mental attitude. You can direct your thoughts and control your emotions and thus regulate your attitude. You can choose whether your attitude will be positive or negative. You can decide whether you will affect, use, control, or harmonize with the changes in yourself and your environment. You can ordain your destiny. When you meet the challenges of change with PMA, you can intelligently solve each problem with which you are confronted. How do you meet a problem with PMA? If you know and believe the first principal element of a positive mental attitude, God is always a good God, then you can effectively use the following formula and meet your problems. When you are faced with a problem that needs a solution, regardless of how perplexing it may be, 1. Ask for divine guidance. Ask for help in finding the right solution. 2. Engage in thinking time for the purpose of solving your problems. Remember that every adversity has the seed of an equivalent or greater benefit for those who have PMA. 3. State the problem. Analyze and define it. 4. State to yourself enthusiastically, that's good. 5. Ask yourself some specific questions, such as A. What's good about it? B. How can I turn this adversity into a seed of equivalent or greater benefit? Or how can I turn this liability into a greater asset? 6. Keep searching for answers to these questions until you find at least one answer that can work. Now, the problems that will confront you will, broadly speaking, be of three kinds. Personal problems, emotional, financial, mental, moral, physical. Family problems and business or professional problems. Because personal problems are the most immediate problems experienced by all of us, we would like to tell you the story of a man who met some of the most severe problems a human being can experience. As you listen to this story, See how he applied PMA to the solution of each difficulty until he achieved ultimate victory. He met his challenge to change with PMA at Leavenworth Penitentiary. This man was born in poverty. While in grade school, he sold newspapers and shined shoes in and around the saloons on Seattle's waterfront to help his mother meet expenses. Later, he became a cabin boy on an Alaskan freighter during the summer months. After he finished high school at the age of 17, he left home. He became one of the horde of hobos that rode the rails and traveled to every part of the United States. 
His companions were hard-bitten men. He gambled, associated with riffraff, men of the so-called Border Legion. Soldiers of fortune, fugitives, smugglers, cattle thieves, and the like were his companions. He joined the forces of Pancho Villa in Mexico. You can't skate close to those extra-legal operations without knowing about them, even if you have nothing to do with them, Charlie Ward said. My mistake was being with the wrong companions. My major sin was associating with people who were bad. From time to time, he won large sums gambling and then lost them. Finally, he was arrested for narcotic smuggling. He was tried and convicted. Yet throughout his life, Charlie Ward maintained his innocence of the charge on which he was convicted. Charlie Ward was 34 years old when he entered Leavenworth. He had never been in jail before in spite of his associates, and he was embittered. He vowed that no prison was strong enough to hold him. He looked for a chance to make a break. Then something happened. Charlie chose to change his attitude from negative to positive. He met the challenge to change with PMA. Something within him told him to stop being hostile and to become the best prisoner in the prison. From that very moment, the entire tide of his life began to flow in the direction most favorable for him. By the simple change from negative to positive thinking, Charlie Ward began to master himself. He changed the direction of his aggressive personality. He forgave the federal agents who had brought about his plight. He quit hating the judge who sentenced him. He took a real good look at the Charlie Ward of the past, and he resolved to avoid the very appearance of evil in the future. He looked around for ways to make his stay in prison as pleasant as possible. First he asked himself some questions, and for the first time in his adult life he found his answer in books, particularly the book. In his prison cell he began to read the Bible. He read it and reread it. Thereafter, and up to the date of his death at the age of 73, he read the Bible every day for inspiration, guidance, and help. Because of his change in attitude, and consequently in behavior, he began to attract favorable notice from the prison officials. And one day, a convict clerk told him that a trustee in the power plant was to be released in three months. Charlie Ward knew little about electricity, but there were books on electricity in the prison library, so he studied. He learned what these books could teach him. At the end of three months, Charlie was ready. He applied for the job. Something about his mannerism and his tone of voice impressed the deputy warden. That something was the earnestness and sincerity of Charlie Ward's positive mental attitude. He got the job. Because he continued to study and work with PMA, Charlie Ward became superintendent of the prison power plant, with 150 men under him. He tried to inspire each one of them to make the best of his situation. When Herbert Hughes Bigelow, president of Brown and Bigelow of St. Paul, Minnesota, arrived at Leavenworth on a conviction of income tax evasion, Charlie Ward also befriended him. In fact, he went out of his way to motivate Bigelow to adjust himself to his environment. Mr. Bigelow was so appreciative of Charlie's friendship and help that as his prison term approached its end, he told Charlie, You have been good to me. When you get out, come to St. Paul. We will have a job for you. Five weeks later, Charlie was released from prison and went to St. Paul. As he had promised, Mr. Bigelow gave Charlie a job. He was given work as a laborer at $25 a week. Because Charlie worked with PMA, he became a foreman within two months. After a year, he became a superintendent. Finally, Charlie was made vice president and general manager. And when Mr. Bigelow died, Charlie was made president of Brown and Bigelow. He continued in this capacity until his own death many years later. Under Charlie's management, sales rose from less than $3 million to over $50 million annually. Brown and Bigelow became the largest company of its kind. Because of Ward's positive mental attitude and his desire to help those less fortunate, he himself received peace of mind, happiness, love, and the better things in life. By presidential decree, his rights as a citizen were restored in acknowledgment of his exemplary life. Those who knew him held him in the highest esteem and were themselves inspired to help others. 
Perhaps one of his most unusual and commendable activities was his employment of over 500 men and women who had come from prisons. They continued their rehabilitation under his stern and understanding guidance and inspiration. He never forgot that he too had been a convict. He wore a tag on his bracelet with his old prison number as a symbol. Charlie Ward had been sentenced to prison. That was good. Why? Who knows what might have become of Charlie Ward had he continued in the direction in which he was headed. But in prison, he met the challenge to change. And there he learned to use PMA to solve his personal problems. He made his world a better world to live in. He became a bigger and better man. No one will ever know the exact number of the needy who have prayed for blessings to Charlie Ward in response to their inner thoughts. I was naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Fortunately, not everyone is faced with problems as severe as those which Charlie Ward was called upon to meet and solve. But there is a lesson in Charlie's story. In addition to the fact that he changed his attitude from negative to positive, you will recall Charlie himself said, My greatest mistake was being with the wrong companions. Negative attitudes are often contagious, and bad habits are contagious. Let each of us look to our own associations and be certain to keep them on the highest possible level. One of the greatest services you can render to children is to motivate them to motivate themselves to select the right kind of friends and associates. Remember, vice is a monster of such awful mean, that to be hated needs but to be seen. Yet seen too oft, familiar with his face, we first endure, then pity, then embrace. Another force with which every human being has to contend, and which, if not met with PMA, can cause physical, moral, and mental destruction, is the power of sex. Sex presents the greatest challenge of change. Each human being has the power to choose for himself whether he will use the tremendous power of sex for good or for evil. Each human being must contend with the problems that will arise in his life because of sex. You can transmute sex into virtue or vice. One of God's greatest gifts to mankind is the power to procreate a human being. Sex is the means of procreation. It is power. Like all power, it can be used for good or for evil. Sex is a physical function of the body under the control of the subconscious and conscious mind. It is inherited. The physical sex organs, works of God, like all His creations, are good. The little difference that makes the big difference between the power of sex being a virtue or a vice is mental attitude. The inherent emotion of sex is one of the most powerful forces of the subconscious mind. The effects of its motivating power can be observed long before adolescence. This power blends with and intensifies the driving force of all other emotions. When it is in conflict with the will of the conscious mind, the power of imagination, as it affects the emotion of sex, has a tendency to win unless the conscious mind uses its power to affect, use, control, or harmonize with the powers of the subconscious. You have the power to choose. Choose wisely with PMA. Transmute sex into virtue. Thus you will win over one of the greatest problems you will ever have to face in your personal life, and you will be physically, mentally, and morally better. And what are the seven virtues? Virtue is moral practice or action, moral excellence, rectitude, valor, chastity. The seven virtues are prudence, fortitude, temperance, justice, faith, hope, and charity. 1. Prudence the ability to govern and discipline oneself by the exercise of reason. 2. Fortitude Strength of mind that enables a person to encounter danger or bear pain or adversity with courage. It is the possession of the stamina essential to face that which repels or frightens one, or to put up with the hardships of a task imposed. It implies triumph. Synonyms are grit, backbone, pluck, and guts. 3. Temperance 
habitual moderation in the indulgence of the appetites and passions. 4. Justice The principle or ideal of just dealing or right action. Also conformity to this principle or ideal. Integrity. 5. Faith. Trust in God. 6. Hope. The desire with expectation of obtaining what is desired or belief that it is obtainable. 7. Charity. The act of loving all men as brothers because they are sons of God. It stresses benevolence and goodwill in giving and in the broad understanding of others with kindly tolerance.